Coming up on Stu Does America, we'll talk with Blaze TV's Jason Buttrell about the brewing situation at the border that totally isn't the fault of the guy who built the cages there in the first place. And Faith Wire's Dan Andros joins us to explain why Andrew Cuomo is awful, Chris Cuomo is worse, but most importantly, Don Lemon is worser. -er. Did you know you can watch a show completely free? I mean, who would pay for it? It's almost on any platform of your choosing. It's true, and you're welcome. Head over to my Instagram page, Stu Does America, and head to the bio for a link for all the places you can watch and listen or help support this network with your own subscription to Blaze TV. Head to blazetv.com slash stew and enter the promo code Stu because that's how they know you like this stupid show and you'll save 10 bucks. We've talked a little bit before about the ridiculous cancel culture effort going on over at The Bachelor, but I gotta admit, it really culminated in the season finale. Let's ruin lives for no good reason at all while we do The Bachelor. I know what you're thinking. You don't care about The Bachelor. And I stand with you on that. I also do not care about The Bachelor. But as an admirer of art, you have to take a moment to gaze at the masterclass in cancel culture that we are witnessing. Also, I want to make you physically cringe when you watch all the clips. So to review the entire situation, some lady on The Bachelor went to an antebellum party in like 2018. What is an antebellum party? I didn't know either until this controversy happened. Basically, apparently, it's a party where people dress up in fancy Southern Belle dresses. Apparently, this is retroactively offensive because some people wore Southern Belle dresses and those people were plantation owners like a zillion years ago and those people had slaves. So it's racist or something to dress up like them a long time after it. Here's the thing. Dressing up in a costume does not make you take over the characteristics of the thing you're dressing up as. If I go out for Halloween as Freddy Krueger, that doesn't mean I'm advocating child murder with razor fingers. If I dress up as a ghost, I'm not actually going to haunt you. If I dress up like a woman, that doesn't mean I'm actually a woman. It's just something that I do on the side to stay sassy. Now, if the story ended with The Bachelor contestant being canceled over a dumb party, it would be ridiculous, but not a masterclass in cancel culture, no, no. That was only achieved when the host of The Bachelor, Chris Harrison, went on a show to talk about these supposedly controversial pictures of a party. While on the show, he basically took a route that was originally described in a very old book with commandments and a big flood and stuff. It's a great read. And he suggested that maybe instead of judging, we should give her some grace and at, le at least hear her side of the story first about you know, why she took that evil picture at that evil party. Well, asking for grace was one step too far for 2021 America. So despite his pathetically groveling apology, he lost his multi-million dollar a year job. Got it? The thing that was offensive was a nothing burger. And Harrison didn't even do the thing that was supposedly offensive. He just said we shouldn't destroy a woman's life over one picture she took when she was 18. And he gets fired. Well, what I didn't realize, because I have absolutely no interest whatsoever in The Bachelor like you. That was apparently, I mean, this woman was apparently the contestant that took the picture. She actually won The Bachelor. Like, I think she now owns him or something, which is ironic considering the antebellum controversy, I will say. So apparently they had this big reveal where she wins the show that had been taped before the controversy started. Fast forward to this week. Now, Chris Harrison has been fired, so they have to bring in a backup host, former Philadelphia Eagles player Emmanuel Acho, who is too muscular for his suit. Someone should tell him that he's too muscular for his suit. He, he needs to get a raise so that he doesn't have to squeeze into this very tight suit. I feel bad for him. This, I mean, the circulation's got to be getting cut off in his arms. 
If I didn't know any better, I'd say he's trying to show them off. Just me. Anyway, they do a post-review uh, episode where they go back over all the stuff that happened to, you know, to squeeze another hour of ratings out of the ridiculous premise of the show and interview the finalists. First, they start with the woman who apparently finished in second place. The Bachelor wanted to hook up with her, sure, but not as much as the retroactively racist girl who we will hear from later. She happens to be, the second place contestant, African-American. So we have the great opportunity to further our racial divides in order to sell just a little more Bud Light Seltzer or whatever is coming up in the next commercial break. She's asked about how she feels about losing out on the man she loved for this newly minted racist. As more and more information started to come out, um, I started to feel hurt by what I was seeing. That was a prime example of not understanding the history behind it, not being educated oh. enough on what that actually meant, what her actions actually meant, how we see it. Mm -hmm. I feel like Rachel has a good heart. <gasps> I do. Uh oh. But uh, I think there's a lot of learning. Mm, a lot of learning. It comes off very inconsiderate. Hold on a second, I'm, I'm confused. Did she just say that Rachel had a good heart? Because that's way more positive than what Chris Harrison got in trouble for. Does she get canceled now? And why would you be hurt because someone wasn't educated on what a party meant? Does that really hurt you? Does this word mean anything anymore? Does it hurt you really? If she did know what it meant and still did it, then maybe I could see you being annoyed. Not hurt, but annoyed. But hurt that she didn't know? That makes absolutely no sense. She was then asked about the incredible burden she had to endure when she realized that the host of her reality show that she appeared on so they could, you know, she could sleep with a good looking person on TV was asking for people to hold off on our crucifixion of her intercourse opponent. Chris Harrison obviously attempted to go to her defense in a conversation with Rachel Lindsay. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen that conversation. Yes, yes, I have, thank you. What are your thoughts? It was another weight oh. that was added on to added the to your life. already really difficult feelings. Very difficult feelings. You know, mm -hmm. all of these issues that issues everyone's talking around and talking addressing around. and apologizing addressing. and making statements but not actually mm -hmm. changing not anything. Changing. There is a point where you're just so exhausted. Oh, it is so exhausting. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Another cross to bear. Another weight added to the other weight of having sex on the TV. And I can understand why it would be so exhausting. I mean, he appears to be in great shape. Then we have the actual female winner of The Bachelor, the antebellum lady, who gets to confess the sins of her whiteness on television and virtue signal to all that will listen to try to rehabilitate herself, of course, through the only way you can do it, public humiliation. Quick question. She did the bad thing, right? Like, she's the one who went to the evil party, right? Chris Harrison just said that we should give her grace. So why is she allowed back on TV and Chris Harrison is at home sobbing into what we can only imagine is a Confederate flag? They both gave the pathetic apologies. Why is she back on TV and he isn't? Kind of weird, huh? Anyway, here's the picture in question. Oh my goodness, look at that. Look at that. I mean, this isn't even a thing. It's her and a couple of her friends in fancy dresses. But luckily, she's on TV to explain her crime. Now, when you look at that photo, what do you see? <sighs> I see someone who was living in this just ignorance, ignorance without even like thinking about who it would be hurting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I never once asked myself at any point, like, what's the tradition behind this? Um, what does this represent? You know, why, why do we wear those dresses? You know why you never stop to ask yourself who it would be hurting? Because it wasn't hurting anyone. 
it would be insane to ask yourself who your dress was hurting because dresses don't hurt people unless maybe it's too small and it starts really riding up. But again, she is, what, she, is she saying she didn't know? If she didn't know what she was supposedly doing was supposedly racist, how can she possibly be expected to avoid it? Before, like a couple of months ago, I don't think anyone knew that dressing up in old timey clothes meant you advocated all of the beliefs of the people of that era. That sounds to me to be a touch insane. There are great Gatsby parties all over the place where people dress up in 1920s clothing. You want to go back and examine the racial views of people in the 1920s? I tried to get people to do that when we were talking about Woodrow Wilson, but it was progressives who kept putting him back in the list of the top 10 presidents. Liking the style of an era does not make you sign on to the belief system of that era. Literally, everyone on earth knows this. But we're supposed to accept that everyone should have known that later on people would start acting like the opposite was always obvious. I mean, listen to her here. She obviously had no malicious intent whatsoever. Now, you knew Matt, a black man, was going to be The Bachelor. Mm -hmm. You also knew these photos existed. Mm -hmm. How often did you lay awake at night worried <laughs> come on. that eventually these photos might come out and could ruin your life? Never. Like, being completely honest, I didn't think no. about it one time. No. Because at that point, you know, it was just me taking some photos with my friends. Yes! It was just you taking pictures with your friends. It still is you taking pictures with your friends. That's it. No more, no less. But hey, The Bachelor is here to save the day. They just expressed their undying love to each other. And he happens to be African-American. He can step up and protect his love. He can help remove her from this terrible firestorm she is facing. He can step up and say, hey, I know her. She's not a racist. I mean, obviously, you're wrong about her. Lay off and stop dragging my girlfriend through the mud. Did he do that? You know, like any real man would. <laughs> of course not. He dumped her in her moment of need after she profusely apologized over what I might remind you was absolutely nothing of consequence. After what seemed like four hours of virtue signaling, he is asked a seemingly pretty rational question. What would you say to people who imply if you broke up with her over an action from three years ago, that wasn't intended to be malicious, then you, Matt James, never really loved Rachel. You know it was a long time ago? What's that? Plantations. Oh! And so I would ask those same people who are so triggered to bring that same energy to supporting folks of color who are asking for change. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're the ones that are triggered here? You think we're triggered? You're the one that dumped a model because she went to a party once. We're not triggered, we're rolling our eyes. And you have to, you have to love the rehearsed nature of all this. The host says, I know, what do you say when people say, it was three years ago, and he responds with totally different language. You know what else was a long time ago? Plantations! <laughs> Good line, buddy. So obviously scripted and planned, but I mean, you know, that's kind of sort of our point, right? Plantations were a long time ago. Your hot girlfriend didn't actually own a plantation. She might be an idiot, but she's not a slave owner. The worst part of all of this is that none of it is real. None of these people actually feel hurt by a stupid party at a sorority three years ago. None of these people think she's a racist, and none of them actually think Chris Harrison did anything wrong. What they do think is that victimization is the ultimate American throne to climb upon. We've now elevated victimhood above achievement and everything else. This dude threw his own girlfriend to the wolves just to signal his virtue to America, just to act like his little feelings were hurt. 
and the show through its host for 19 seasons to the Wolves because he simply appealed that, you know what? Maybe a young woman shouldn't be publicly destroyed over a minor misstep that she supposedly made in college. Every single one of you involved in the show is awful in every single way. You all deserve each other right down to your very shallow core. I just worry what it means for the rest of us. Holy crap, are we screwed. Trying to buy or sell a home in these times can be challenging. Considering everyone's insane, it really is a challenge. Uh, you need a real estate agent that you can really trust, someone who knows all the details, the ins and outs, the best practices, the best neighborhoods, the best play ways to, to juice up an advertisement to get more people to see your home. Who is that person? I don't know who it is. I just know where to find them. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go. You go to realestateagentsitrust.com. You, you take a look around. You find the agent that's best for you. You know everyone's on, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the site is already screened, so you don't have to worry about that. You know they're all good. Find the best one for you, and then go get the best price for your home. You need to get the best price. You need someone who goes above and beyond just the basics. You need realestateagentsitrust.com. Get more information at realestateagentsitrust.com. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. I'm pleased to be joined now by the head writer and researcher for Glenn Beck and all Glenn Beck related enterprises. It's Jason Buttrell. Now with hair. Now with you hair. You didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> now with hair. Did, is it, uh, I mean, is it real hair? Did you sprinkle it on? How does it work? I, how dare you, sir? <laughs> I'm like all natural. You don't ask those questions to a woman, you no, know? Like, yeah, no, I do, actually. I always do. <laughs> Are they real? Uh, and they say, um, they, they usually slap you when you say that. <laughs> I, was, I was talking about your shoes. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about the border. Um, has this been a crazy sort of couple of weeks? Because I think Biden had this idea that he could walk in here, do whatever he wanted, and the media would, would, would run cover for him. And at some level, they have. But I think the problem has been too big, too fast, and everybody's noticing. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm very surprised. I think I saw even the New York Times write something on it. Um, I think they definitely feel like an obligation to uh, continue to push. Not too hard, obviously. Mm -hmm. They're not going all crazy, like sending out swarms of cameramen to, to you know, film AOC crying at a parking lot. Mm -hmm. They're not going that far. Uh, but I do feel like they, they feel like, you know, obligated at this point to actually continue to, to, to give at least an update about what's going on. What, what they're very, doing very, very cautiously, though, is calling this a crisis. Of course, the White House will not call this a crisis. Right. Um, I think, uh, was, it, was it CNBC? They're going the furthest I've seen uh, mm. any of the others. That, that thing, that, the article that dropped yesterday, that um, the Biden administration, this is kind of strange. The Biden administration was reporting that they had 4,000 um, unaccompanied minors in, in custody. Mm -hmm. And now that's what, 13,000 is the actual number. Jeez. So, so what exactly is the, what exactly is the truth here? Did, were they lying to us about this? Or did, you know, actually, you know, I, I have heard that climate change, you know, it, not only does it change <laughs> the weather, it causes yeah. fires in California every oh, no. year. You know, it causes hurricanes mm -hmm. too, if you didn't know. But there's an unknown other side effect, which it can kind of spawn a division of Greyhound buses filled with unaccompanied minors. <laughs> oh my gosh. They drop from the ozone. That sounds Still, terrible. That, that happens. Sounds terrible. So we think that might be it. That I think that could be it. Uh, <laughs> there is this thing that I keep coming back to, if I'm trying to be somewhat generous, in that Every president in my lifetime has had some version of a border crisis. Yeah. Every single one of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is a really good argument to actually fix the problem long term, right? like fix our immigration system, fix the border and s secure it to people we don't want crossing it. But that being said, this is a hard problem to deal with. Yeah. And I think maybe the, the, the problem here is not necessarily what, what's happening to Biden now. It's just how unfairly they treated Trump a few, a month, you know, a couple of years before that. Yeah, we, so we have, the right has lost the culture war in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just talking about this recently on, on another show. I was watching a talk show or a podcast with Sarah Silverman. Oh yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You see that, where, where yep. she actually said that, look, we can get away with that 
because everyone knows that we don't have any ill intent right. when we do these things. Mm-hmm. We, can t- we can tell these jokes. We can have these crises at the border. They know that we, we're, we're all about the love. We have, we have no bad intentions, so we can do them. The other side, they don't. They have bad intentions. Right. That is really what, I, I really do think that's what they believe. It's insane. Even, even take it to Cuomo now. I, I seriously think that most people don't care about these Me Too you know, accusations. Mm-hmm. Granted, they're only accusations, so we don't know really mm-hmm. what's going on for sure. But, um, but it doesn't matter. It seems like most of them are kind of giving them a pass. To, to this day, I still don't think anything's going to happen to him. I think so. he basically pulled the Biden, Biden excuse. Pulled mm-hmm. the Biden excuse, hey, that's just the way I am. Eventually, that'll be accepted. I went to Alyssa Milano's Twitter page. <laughs> Not a single mention of that. <laughs> Not a single mention of that. That's amazing. Absolutely ridiculous. But to go to your point, this is, it is. It, this is a constant issue. Um, Bill Clinton, under him, I think it was Operation Gatekeeper, built a border wall. Uh, a very mm-hmm. substantial, large, uh, p- several mile. Uh, I can't remember how many miles it was, but built the border wall. I mm-hmm. still remember that. I'm getting old. Um, under Janet Reno and himself is when the whole, you know, separating families and all that stuff and keeping kids, you know, in separate facilities. I, I don't think we can call them cages anymore, can we? No, now uh, they're just facilities. Facilities. There's a Democrat Reception office. facilities. Reception facilities. That's what mm-hmm. it is. Um, under Bush, it was pretty much the same thing. Uh, you know, under uh, uh, Obama, he was called the deporter in chief for crying out loud. Yeah. He built the damn cages that we're seeing right now, but they did not hold him to that standard. Why? Oh, because he's a Democrat. He's under a different set of standards. I do think that you're right, that there is a built in implicit belief that anything a Democrat does is coming from a good place. And anything yeah. a Republican does is coming from a bad place. So when there is a success for a Republican, it's usually like, oh, man, well, they lucked into this. Like, you know, for example, I'll give you an example. This is the. Uh, uh, the the early banning of travel travel from China by Trump in the in the coronavirus uh, you know beginnings that was brushed off as well he just hates China right like so he just happened to luck out because he wanted to punish China he found a reason to do it and it happened to be the right move later on where a Democrat who does that is the brilliant person who sees these things early and we're seeing this in the Me Too movement we see this on the border there is this uh, implicit belief by places like you know by people like AOC all the way to the New York Times and all over the left and the media which say okay when Biden has a border crisis it's a challenge Uh, people just think he's such a good guy and he's gonna be nice to them so they're coming and you can understand that they don't think there's evil anymore here so all these people are coming and and it's almost like too good for migrants and when Trump does something and 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 has to deal with a situation like this it's like when you believe the man is already Hitler well of course you apply uh, a negative uh, prism to it I mean right. it's it's uh, it's an it's in a way understandable but still completely wrong right and I hope that this is drawing more people from the center to be a little bit more sane about these things um, I said from the very beginning that the that the the situation to the border that Biden was going to act exactly the same way as Trump did. Mm-hmm. That nothing would change, but nobody would call him out on it. Um, and you're totally right. All, a lot of these problems that we have in the country are consistent. They're, they're the, pretty much the same in every single administration. Only one side uses it for their moral superiority, show mm-hmm. how virtuous they are. And then they flip that around when the other side gets in power and they show how they're not morally, you know, they're morally bankrupt and have no virtue. Right. But come on, let's be honest. I mean, I'm libertarian light, so I hate everything involved with the government. I pretty much hate every single politician. Um, not every single one, but most of them. Mm-hmm. And again, not every single one, but most of them are morally bankrupt. They're narcissists. They're there for a reason. Um, most of them are just gaming the system, seeing what they can get. I mean, this is both sides. Yeah. See what, how they can benefit as a whole from whatever thing is bad is happening at the time. They all think this way. And Democrats, their hypocrisy is so insane. They're the same on immigration. They don't give a crap about immigrants. <laughs> no, oh they, God, no. It's the same about the poor. They don't no. give a crap about the poor. They want to no. keep people poor and, and leverage that for more power. That's it's, what it's all about. All right, we got about one more minute here. Let me, let me, let me go one place you mentioned here. You want to get people who aren't you know, hardcore ideologues on either side to see the light on some of these things. They're, you know, some of these things they're never going to see the light on, I don't think. You know, the border is never, I don't think they're ever going to see the light on the border. But is there one area? I kind of think maybe it's wokeness that can, like, actually awake, awaken people to say, this is crazy. Like, going down these roads are nuts. When they see, uh, you know, a, a boy beating their daughter in, you know, high school sports in girls, uh, uh, you know, girls track, there is an awakening among even regular people who don't think about these things all the time, that they see the absurdity of all these claims. 
Is that is that the right area that maybe conservatives should be focusing on? I mean, I think you have a really good point um, because you're seeing a lot of people, even in Hollywood, that are starting to kind of get pulled away off of that. Mm. And it's it's coming for for them all. It's it's going to you're going to do something in this climate that's going to piss somebody off. Um, look, even athletes I, I've seen that are getting hit with this and that are trying to stand up for themselves and saying, "Wait a minute, what the heck?" Yeah. Um, Desh uh, Deshaun Watson was just hit by a, a, another Me Too thing. Yep. He's saying absolutely this is bullcrap. Um, could he have said that? Uh, what was that? Two years ago or whatever? Probably not. Uh, he probably wouldn't even been given a chance at all. He probably would have been ran out and been, you know, the Texans would have been boycotted. Uh, I don't know. I, I do. I do think that they're starting to move away from that. The more it's it's the same really with every uh, like far left or liberal insanity. Mm -hmm. Once you take it to its ultimate, you know, end, you see how utterly ridiculous it is. Yeah. Gender. Okay, come on. How many genders are we going to? What, what are we even up to at this point? I, thousands. I thousands. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you, the further off you take it to where, okay, this is where it ends up, you see how stupid it is and yeah. how detrimental it is. Maybe that's what finally wakes people up. I, I hope. I, what else will? I, I hope. I don't know. I don't know. Jason Buttrell, a head writer and researcher for Glenn Beck. Uh, you had a big special coming up tonight, but Glenn's unfortunately has back thrown out. So you're going to do that next week? Is yeah, that what we're going to do that next week. Okay, good. That's oh, no, no, actually, good. we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna re-air something tonight yeah. that we did two weeks ago that you have to, have to take a look at okay. to understand it. And then next week, we're building on it. It's going to be good. Oh, very cool, very cool. Uh, don't forget to support Jason's excellent work with your own subscription to Blaze TV. Head to blazetv.com slash stew, enter the promo code stew, because that's how they know you like this stupid show, and you'll save 10 bucks. Jason, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, back in a second. Well, we've progressed in the last few years, you know. We've gone from a country where something like this could happen... In 1987, an op-ed by the New York Times uh, editorial board. So this is like their full statement on the issue. 1987. It's entitled, The Right Minimum Wage is Zero Dollars and Zero Cents. This is from the freaking New York Times. Let me give you this quote. There is a virtual consensus among economists that a minimum wage is an idea whose time has passed. The New York Times did this entire op-ed telling America that we shouldn't even have an, a minimum wage. Now everyone's demanding at least $15 an hour. We've gone from a society where the left-wing paper will tell you uh, that $0 is an appropriate minimum wage to a country where a mom wanted to bring her kid to school but couldn't because the school was closed. So they had online learning. Problem is, she had a Chromebook that wouldn't charge, couldn't get her kid to actually get to online classes. What happened? The police showed up at her house and fined her $439. We are going the wrong direction in far too many areas. Back in a second. I feel like sometimes we, as we go through life, we forget some of the basics. And some of the basics, like for a good credit score, you pay your bills, right? You make sure that your bills are paid on time. That's about it. And it should take care of itself. Well, times change. And now there are these complicated algorithms and all of these things that can really affect your life. Scoremaster decided to reverse engineer these algorithms that the credit bureaus have and say, let me, let me actually show people exactly when to pay the bill, how much to pay, uh, how often they should pay. Maybe they should pay more than once a month. Who knows? Uh, they have all the details on what can help you. And basically what they do is they, they look at your credit and they say how many plus points you can add to your credit score. The average uh, listener uh, to this podcast gets 61 points in 20 days or less. Go to scoremaster.com slash stew. Get your 61 points. It's only three weeks away. Scoremaster.com slash stew. It's scoremaster.com slash stew. There's an ancient saying uh, that goes something like this. Um, Andrew Cuomo is awful. Chris Cuomo is worse. And Don Lemon is worse -er. That's right. By the way, you can get all this at stewdoesmerch.com. Any one of the mugs. In fact, I would recommend having the entire set. But is it true? Is Don Lemon worse -er than the other two? Welcome back to my uh, good friend, Dan Andros, managing editor of faithwire.com. Be sure to head over to the Faithwire YouTube channel and subscribe. They're doing some great stuff over there. Dan, how's it going? It's going 
It's going great. Thanks for having me. I don't know why you don't have a mug yet. We need to make sure we get you one. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's been an interesting thing, this Don Lemon sort of controversy. Yeah. To review, he kind of became, I guess, the voice of Catholicism. Um, and I don't know if he's creating sort of a new reading of the scriptures, but he's trying to interpret uh, religion uh, based on this statement um, uh, from the Pope in which he's going to try to you know, uh, fit modern lifestyle sort of into uh, the old framework of religion. Can you kind of give us this from the beginning? What did the Pope actually say? Right. Well, the Pope came out and they, you know, they said that they can't bless same sex unions because God can't bless sin was essentially I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but that's basically what they said. Uh, and so Don Lemon was on The View. I guess he's got a book out. Uh, maybe it's called Don Lemon is Worse. -er. I don't know what the title of his book is. Um, but he's on The View and they ask him about this, this, you know, about this comment, which is kind of kind of a weird ask anyway. It, it's like they're just setting up this conflict. But uh, instead of him just saying, well, you know, of course, I disagree with, you know, the Vatican's views on same sex marriage. Uh, he goes into then to this, this is the th this is the part of it that kind of fascinates me. He he goes in to sort of give his idea of what God is like. And he said, God's not out there disrupting, you know, people and he's not getting in the way. And, and God's, you know, he's not judging people. Uh, and so I don't understand this need for and I don't know what Don Lemon's personal religious beliefs are. I don't pretty sure he doesn't identify as a Christian. Um, I think he has made a comment that he believes in a higher power like in general, mm -hmm. um, but doesn't have it really narrowed down. So uh, I'm just fascinated sort of in that aspect of it. Like, why do you feel the need if you're not really a Christian or don't identify as a Christian or Catholic? Um, you know, part of it, then why, why would you bother trying to make this fit your worldview? Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really strange phenomenon. Yeah. He says, um, he, he does go on to say, uh, some odd, I think odd things. People look at his, I mean, look, I'm not going to Don Lemon for his theology, I suppose, <laughs> but it no. is interesting that sort of need that there is to say, well, in reality, God is fine with whatever thing I'm doing. It, it, it's like if you don't, if you're not, uh, if you're not Catholic, what do you care what the Pope says? I mean, I, I'm not Catholic. Like, I don't care what the Pope says. He can say things; they don't really affect me. Right. You know, if he obviously there are a lot of similar teachings and and and, and a lot of uh, common ground there that I I would share with Catholics. But you know, so there's some differences as well. You know, if you don't, if you're not Catholic, why do you why do you care in the first place? Yeah, I, I dove into that a little bit and explored the possible reasons for that over on uh, Faithwire today, if you guys want to check it out. But one of the things I pointed out uh, was perhaps it has, has something to do with Romans 1, which is God has made um, himself evident through his creation, that we're without excuse. We, we know God exists because just creation of itself speaks to him. And, uh, and then what happens is man in our sin, we suppress that truth in unrighteousness. That's what Romans one says. And so I think maybe there's some of that at play, like, you know, maybe he knows and, uh, you know, cause some people are just in full on rebellion and they're just like, just don't even acknowledge God exists at all. But then there are these people that are sort of these tweeners that <laughs> don't want to rule out the existence of God and they want to follow God, but then they also... Well, that just knocked my microphone over there. <laughs> it's passion. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, but then then it's just, the hands are moving. Yeah. Uh, but then they don't want to give up their the way, you know, their sin and basically how they're living or their lifestyle or what they've got going on. And obviously Don being an openly gay man, you know, has some conflict there with the scripture, which is very clear on that issue. So I, I think there's probably some of that dynamic at play uh, with him, but because logically there's no reason to latch on to any of that or to even try to explain that. Um, and, you know, Don Lemon, I don't think he's a dumb guy. So it's it's very interesting to me. It's hard to believe that this would be coming out of ignorance, that he actually thinks, you know, God doesn't judge people. I mean, that's kind of <laughs> kind the, of the whole premise. I, you know, my what I said in the article was, you know, maybe he should refer to the book of Genesis where God floods the entire earth <laughs> and kills every li living thing in it, sands the sands the animals and the people that got onto Noah's Ark because everyone was sitting 24 seven and they had nothing but wicked thoughts. And God kind of judged them. He's a tad uh, particular on the issue of sin. Um, so, and, and obviously, you know, Jesus came and took that judgment that was due for us, you know, as the 
the basic Christian belief. We're mm-hmm. sinners in need of a Savior, and that's what Christ did on the cross for us and endured the wrath of God, the judgment of God. He endured that for us. So I have to imagine that Don Lemon knows that. So, um, you know, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he's just ignorant there and just kind of pushing a view of God that he that makes him feel good. Well, first of all, I just want you to know that we we provide extra hands here so you don't bump them into the microphone. We do that for safety <laughs> of our guests, and you can always take advantage of that. Um, I, I will say, though, there, there is that, like, let me give you this quote here. It's, it's it, But if you believe something that hurts another person or does not give someone the same rights or freedoms, not necessarily under the Constitution because this is under God, uh, I think that this is wrong, and I think that the Catholic Church and many other churches really need to re-examine themselves and their teachings, because that is not what God is about. God is not about hindering people or even judging people. I mean, God definitely is about hindering people and judging people, right? Like, it's not all he's about, but like, there's a specific set of things God wants you to do, and you will be judged on whether you do them or not, right? Now, he talk, yeah. goes on to say, um, uh, where is the, uh, here he goes, if you believe in Jesus, that is to love your fellow man and judge not, uh, not lest ye be not judged, is the way he phrased it, which is not exactly right. right. But, incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, though, it's not saying that, he, he, that's a message to man, right? Like, it's a message, don't judge right. people right. as a man. Of course, the of course. I, 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 like, it's so bizarre and such a, a strange backward belief, but it seems to be this thing that happens today where we've converted faith into this sort of Pinterest saying type of thing <laughs> where, like, basically all it means is be nice to people and never comment on any of their actions. And that's just not what I think faith is. No, and basically what he's asking you to do is take your take your brain out and not think. Um, and I think you challenge his presuppositions there. I mean, you go into what he's talking about with, well, that's wrong. We need to challenge their... Uh, their views and anything that hinders what someone else wants to do. And it's like, well, hold on a second. Let's back up here, Don. Let's talk about what marriage is. What is marriage? You know, and so no one's trying to hinder you. I mean, gay men are free to enter in the institution of marriage, which is a man and a woman as designed by God. So um, they're trying to just change what that is. Now, that that's a whole nother uh, debate for another day. But it's interesting to me that he would say, well, that's wrong. And they need to go back and look at their views and rethink them. Well, according to who, Don? You? Mm. Um, You know, when you really boil it down to what is he basing that on? He's basing that on the personal preferences of Don Lemon and um, what Don Lemon thinks. Uh, Because obviously, um, you know, the Bible doesn't teach what he's talking about. uh, And so they shouldn't have to go rearrange everything because Don Lemon doesn't like it. I think, too, uh, and that's totally true. And I think that that's the fundamental thing that you'd think human beings can get directly from the church and religion specifically, right? Like, it, you know, we, the, these concepts are out there and, and, and they, are, they don't change, right? God doesn't change. Uh, right. But if, when you talk about the church, what we see often is they do change, right? We, we see the, cha- the, the church change opinion because something becomes popular or something becomes frowned upon. And these things change kind of constantly, it seems, all the time. There's always a new statement from some branch of a church saying, you know what, this new thing that's out there, we never really thought of it this way before, so now God likes it. <laughs> and it's like, well, if, if we get anything from, from church and religion as formed by human beings, it should be that standard that holds the line against cultural current, right? Like, if, if we don't get that from church, what is the point of it? Yeah. Yeah, and it, and you really have to. I mean, it's probably frustrating for a lot of people if you're looking for a biblical church that's willing to uh, stand on that. It, it 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 must be frustrating because you're seeing it now too with a lot of this woke movement uh, and critical theory is sort of seeping its way into churches, and um, it, you know it's it's very dangerous because you have basically a theology. Um, you know, of course, combating racism and all that is is a worthwhile task and and um, getting along and in harmony with with all the different races of people that are out there. Um, but this critical theory sort of puts race above everything else. Mm. And uh, it puts the gospel sort of becomes this secondary thing that's under the umbrella of this whole giant critical theory and this critical race theory. 
And um, and interestingly enough, from a Christian perspective, there's no solution there because, um, as you know, Stu, critical theory puts the you know the, the the person in power is the racist. That's what makes them the racist. That's why they say certain people can't be racist because they don't have the power. Uh, so uh, Tim Keller pointed this out in a in a critique of critical theory, and he talked about well, what do you do when the power shifts? What do you do? when the people that are the oppressed then become the oppressor. Now, are they now racist and then have to hand that over? And then what happens to the people that hand over that power and then it switches again? Or it just, it's just never ending loop of whoever's on top is racist. So his point there was to show that there's no actual um, redemption there. There's no actual solution uh, to any of those issues there. It can only be found in the gospel. And if you start putting that first, you're going to just walk yourself into a whole bunch of problems. But to your point, I think we're seeing that in the church today. They're capitulating uh, on a whole number of issues. Well, and there, there's no foundational truth if constantly the racist and oppressor is constantly switching places uh, yeah. with the oppressed, right? right? Like there's, there's, there's no truth to it. We know it's not true. We know the thing attached to that can't be true because it can switch so often. Maybe the <laughs> idea is like to have a foundational belief and stick by it and, you know, I, like to me, it's this happens in politics a lot, you know, and it happens on the right, too, where sometimes churches get super political and, and they're not necessarily teaching yeah. all that much gospel anymore. Uh, sometimes it goes the opposite way. And it's like if your church winds up with one or zero people left in it, but you are being consistent in what you believe, that should be your goal. You should not yeah. care if anyone shows up. That is not the point yeah. of church. You're, you're, this is not like a freaking you know uh, concert series where you're just trying to draw people in to get the numbers up. You get, like you shouldn't care. And if the church collapses, well then that, maybe that's what God wanted to happen. You know, you need <laughs> yeah. to stick to what you believe is true in the Bible. And I know there's disagreement here and there on those things, but you have to be able to make up your mind and stick to it. I think. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you there, and I think you're right. I think there's a pressure on a lot of churches to keep the numbers up and to not say certain things uh, because they know they'll lose people over it. And and of course, you know, denominations and different Christians are gonna are gonna disagree on on certain things. That's fine. That's normal. You know, that's that's to be expected. But yeah, to the point we're seeing it today, it's it's very problematic. And um and as you mentioned, God does not change. He is a constant and. And really, that's kind of one of my sticking points, too, is is looking at, again, these presuppositions that people have. I really think that we have to go back to defining our terms and looking at what we're, we're presupposing, what we're basing things on, because um, a lot of this talking past each other can be avoided if we just get to the actual heart of the matter. And you say, well, what are you basing that on? Well, it's just, I guess it's just my opinion. OK, great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your opinion, Don Lemon, on what the Catholic Church should do. OK. Wonderful. <laughs> You've shared that. Um, but, you know, they, they pronounce these things like they're some kind of universal truths. Uh, but, you know, obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of problems, you know, consistency wise when you when it comes to moral relativism. Well, I'm concerned that you seem to be suggesting a world that we do not go to Don Lemon for our religious advice. <laughs> and I cannot have a world like that. I can't take it. Uh, Dan Andros, managing editor of Faithwire. What's the name of the op ed and where can people find it? Um, wow. I, uh, the, the name of the op-ed is, uh, why do unbelievers bother distorting the Bible? I'd forgotten it there for a second. You can find it at faithwire.com. All right. Check it out and follow Dan Andros at Dan Andros on Twitter. Managing editor of Faithwire. Thanks so much for hanging out today, Dan. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. Don Lemon is Worserer. Back in a second. <laughs> We talked today about the theology of Don Lemon. You know, the only real way to get into the Church of Don is to get your very own Don Lemon is Worserer mug. You can get the whole set. You know, people said uh, Andrew Cuomo is awful. Well, Chris Cuomo is worse. We've got Andrew Cuomo is awful. Chris Cuomo is worse. Don Lemon is Worserer. All available at StuDoesMerch.com as well as these fancy Nancy Pelosi sucks pens for a limited time. We'll see you tomorrow.